Chapter 20, Piccolo Power. The alien invasion rumors had reached the adults too, as I found out that night at dinner. My goodness, Susan, said my mother as she was dishing up my broccoli. I hope you don't believe any of this nonsense. Believe it, I thought. I started it. But I didn't say that. Instead, I put down my soup spoon and I looked at her. What if I did believe it, I asked. I tried hard to sound like I was interested, not like I was challenging her. Well, I suppose we'd have to get you counseling, she said. I could have cried. Obviously, there was no point in asking my parents to help out with this mess. I went upstairs to get ready. Which ones will it be? I wondered as I slipped into my dress. Just who is the alien going to steal? I looked in the mirror and crossed my fingers, praying that it wouldn't be me. My parents drove me to school. They dropped me off and went to find a parking place. I wonder how he's going to do it, I thought, as I walked through the door. Will it be just freeze every will he just freeze everyone here on the spot? Will his ship use some sort of tractor beam to lift up his targets? Or will he wait until later when everyone is asleep? and then sneak into their homes and snatch them. The school was fairly zinging with nervous energy. The rumors about the alien invasion had spread to all the grades. The third graders were walking around in pairs, checking over their shoulders every other step. If I hadn't been so scared myself, I would have laughed. I wanted to grab them and say, Stop worrying. The alien's not after you. Hey, Susan, called Peter. Wait up. Peter was in chorus. The chorus was bigger than the band. Almost every kid in the sixth grade was a member. They would be singing last of all. Peter looked very nice. He had on a white shirt and a red tie. His pale blonde hair was slicked down. Is your father here, I asked. He just stared at me. Are you kidding, he asked. We walked on until we came to a private place. What are we going to do, I asked. Peter shrugged. What can we do? Keep our eyes open. Be ready to call for help when there's something we can prove. Other than that, I can't think of anything. Is Brock's home here? I nodded. All of the teachers had come to the concert to keep us under control while we were waiting to perform. I figured Brock's home wasn't ready to blow his cover yet. Peter glanced at his watch. We'd better get into the gym, he said. No sense in getting into any more trouble than we have to. The gym was where we had to wait for our turn to perform. It was across the hall from the combination cafeteria and auditorium, where we put, our, put on our concerts. The third grade chorus was about to go on when Peter and I walked in. Get over here, you two, hissed Miss Tompkins, the world's oldest living fifth grade teacher. They're ready to start. As we walked across the gym, I heard third grade chorus begin to sing. They had only gotten through about three notes when the music stopped. I grabbed Peter's arm. Had it started? Not actually, as it turned out. Cindy Farkas had fainted. The chorus teacher, Miss Benkin, stopped the program while two parents helped Cindy out. Then the singing began again. False alarm, said Peter with a grin. I nodded, but I didn't feel like smiling. Suddenly, I heard a familiar voice. Band members, band members, over this way. It was Mr. Smith. He was standing at the far end of the cafeteria holding up his arm, uh, his hand. Band members, over here, he shouted. We're going down to the primary wing. Mr. Bamwick wants you to meet there to tune up. You can bet Brock's home won't stick around for that, said Peter. Not the way he hates music. Well, that gave me an idea. I might not have done it if I hadn't been feeling so crabby. But between the fact that we hadn't figured out any way to stop Brock's home from kidnapping some of our class and the fact that he was still holding the best teacher I had ever had, prisoner, I was pretty mad. I decided if I couldn't beat an alien, 
I'd settle for annoying him. So before we started down the hall, I took my piccolo out of its case and put it together. Most of the other kids already had their instruments ready. Everybody was nervous. And it wasn't just pre-concert jitters. About half the band was made up of sixth graders. They were the most frightened, of course, especially the ones from our class. All right, follow me, said Brock's home as he started down the hall. Holding my piccolo behind my back, I positioned myself at the front of the group. When we got about halfway down the hall, I started to play a scale. Stop that, shouted Brock's home before I had played just three notes. Just practicing, I said. Well, don't, he snapped. I had never really heard him sound so cranky before. I must have really gotten to him. I began to wonder if I could break through his false front, get him to show himself for what he really was. I put the piccolo to my lips and began to play again. Miss Simmons, stop that, he ordered again, but this time I didn't stop. Please, he said, clapping his hands over his ears. Miss Simmons, please stop. I couldn't believe it. He was in agony. I began to play louder. Susan, he howled, bending over. Stop. I took the piccolo away from my lips for just an instant. Not on your life, Brock's home. Then I started to play again. The best piccolo music I knew. The solo from the Stars and Stripes forever. Stop it, shouted Brock's home, stumbling down the hall ahead of me. Stop, stop, stop. Help me, you guys, I said. That was a big mistake. As soon as I took a pause from playing, Brock's home spun around and snatched at my piccolo. But I pulled it back to safety before he could tear it from my hands. Take this, you alien creep. And then I trilled him with a high C. He backed away, holding his hands to his ears. I went back to the stars and stripes, starting at the beginning. I heard Mike Ferran join me on his saxophone. Then Billy Gooch brought in the trumpet. We advanced on Brock's home, playing for all we were worth. He retreated down the hall, his handsome face twisted with pain. Now the clarinets were coming in, and the rest of the trumpets. Then came the drums. And finally, deep and low and powerful, the sousaphone. We sounded fantastic. Mr. Bamwick came running out of the room where he had been waiting for us. They're playing it, he cried in joy. They're playing it. But now I heard Dr. Bleakman charging down the hall behind us. What's going on out here, he roared. Smith, Bamwick, can't you keep those kids under control? They're playing it, cried Mr. Bamwick joyfully. Seven years I've been waiting for this. Stop that, roared, roared Bleakman. No, cried Mr. Bamwick. Don't stop now. Let me hear it. We couldn't stop. We were on a roll. We had never sounded so good. And Brock's home was crumbling before us. Stop, he pleaded. Stop, stop. Adults were crowding out of the auditorium and into the hall. What's going on, they shouted. What's happening out here? We reached the big finale. I played that trill like I had never played it before. We kept advancing on Brock's home. Soon, the new Kennetuck Falls Elementary School marching band had the alien cowering in the corner. What do you want, he pleaded. I didn't dare stop playing. I knew my piccolo was keeping him at bay. But Mike stepped in. Take off your mask, he shouted. Your mask, cried the others. Take off your mask. Anything, said Brock's home. Just stop that noise. First your mask, cried the band. Even Dr. Bleakman could see that there was something weird about his favorite teacher now. He waited in silence. 
I played my trill again. Broxholm reached behind his head and began to peel off his face. Behind us, people started to scream. Someone cried, what is it? What's happening? Oh my gosh, yelled someone else. It's Mr. Smith. He's, he's an alien.